flipped classroom video for Maths A2 Unit 3 Points of Inflection So if we look at changing concavity which we've looked at in a previous video um, we got to the point where we'd seen that when a function changes from concave to convex or vice versa then we get a turning point for dy by dx. Um, if we plot the second derivative now, d2y by dx squared, onto the same picture, then if dy by dx has a turning point, then the second derivative has to be zero. So we see the points l, m and n, where we can see that the second derivative is zero and that corresponds to the points where we have changes of concavity, the purple points between the brown and the red and then the red and the blue and the blue and the orange. So what we also notice is of course that the second derivative must be changing sign at these points. So at the first one it's going up and d2r by dx squared changes sign. Second one it's going down and it's changing sign and at the third one it's going up from negative through zero to positive. Okay, so this takes us to what our definition of a point of inflection is. So when a curve changes from concave to convex or vice versa we have a point of inflection. And this first one we have a non-stationary point of inflection and that's when the gradient for the curve itself is not zero so you'll see at the top it says if the gradient of the curve is non-zero we have a non-stationary point of inflection but if it is zero we have a stationary one so thinking moving along now the red part of the curve and where the concavity changes again is that going to be stationary or non-stationary well, the curve itself uh, has a non-zero gradient, so it must be a non-stationary point of inflection. But the final one, you can probably see or remember from looking at the graph previously, that is a stationary point of inflection because the gradient of the curve there is actually zero. OK, now we're going to think about the classification of these, which is slightly tricky. So we're looking at the gradient, dy by dx, the gradient of the gradient, d2y by dx squared, concavity, and then the third derivative, d3y by dx cubed. So for a turning point, the gradient will be zero, uh, and it will be changing sign. The gradient of the gradient is generally non-zero for turning points but it can be zero but either way it doesn't change sign. The concavity remains the same at a turning point. For a non-stationary point of inflection the gradient is not zero because it's non-stationary and dy by dx is at a maximum or a minimum. The gradient of the gradient, the second derivative, is zero and it is changing sign. The concavity changes and the third derivative will be non-zero. For a stationary point of inflection, the gradient again is zero and is at a maximum or a minimum. The gradient of the gradient, the second derivative, is also zero and it's changing sign. So for a stationary point of inflection the second derivative is changing sign whereas for a turning point the second derivative is not changing sign. And we'll look at that on the next slide. The concavity is changing, that's what a point of inflection is. Now to test whether we have a stationary point of inflection or a turning point when we get zero for both the first two derivatives we can use the third derivative. The third derivative, if it were non-zero, that would tell us we have a stationary point of inflection.
but it can be zero still. And in fact, the rule here is that the first non-zero derivative has to be an odd derivative for it to be a stationary point of inflection. But that means it could be the fifth derivative, d5y by dx to the 5. Or it could be the 11th. It could be zeros all the way down to the 11th, d11y by dx to the 11. Now, that was a silly example because we're never going to differentiate all that way down. There's a much better way of doing it which we'll see uh, in a moment. Now that brings to mind also that the opposite is true for a turning point. For a turning point the first non-zero derivative is an even derivative. So we could be testing that in a similar way. In fact if we have a look at what I've called a special case, it's not particularly a special case but it's just a bit of a problematic case I guess you could say, um, is that if the first and second derivatives are zero we could have a turning point or a point of inflection as I've just said. Now to find out which we've got we could keep differentiating until we find a non-zero derivative and as said before if this is an even derivative we would then have a turning point or if it's an odd derivative we'd have a stationary point of inflection. But probably it's better to use the change of sign test. So if the second derivative doesn't change sign we have a turning point and if the second derivative changes sign we have a stationary point of inflection. And you, you've probably come across the change of sign test before. Um, we could test the function itself or the first derivative once we've discovered that the first and second derivatives are zero. But here we're just going to have a look at uh, testing the second derivative. So um, let's have a look at f of x is x cubed and g of x is x to the power of 4 at x equals naught. So first of all we'll do our derivatives. So we have f dash of x is 3x squared and f double dash of x is 6x and for x to the power of 4 the first derivative is 4x cubed and the second is 12x squared. Next we'll put our point, so we're considering x equals 0, we'll pop that in and we see that f of 0 is naught, f dash of 0 is naught, f double dash of 0 is naught and the same for g, g dash and g double dash. So at that point we can't distinguish between them um, but what we can do is look either side of naught in the second derivative and we see that for x cubed if we go just below naught to minus 0 0.1 we get a negative second derivative which is less than naught of course and if we put 0 0.1 in we get a positive second derivative greater than naught. For g double dashed if we put just below naught minus 0 0.1 in we get a positive result 0.12 and if we put plus 0.1 in so just above the point 0 or the x value 0 I should say we also get 0.12 which is also greater than 0 so there is no change of sign and if we look at the graphs that's our x cubed of course and we see that we do have a stationary point of inflection at 0 and that was predicted, if you like, by the second derivative changing sign. Whereas for g, x to the power of 4 looks like that. And we have a minimum at 0. And we see that the uh, sign of the second derivative didn't change. And also the fact that it was greater than 0 is pointing us towards the fact that we have a minimum because the function is going upwards. OK, so best way to uh, start to get to grips with this is to look at an example. So find and classify the turning points and points of inflection for the function y equals x to the 4 plus 6x cubed and sketch the function. Step 1, find the first and second derivatives. We need those to, to start classifying uh, anything really. So dy by dx is, well x to the power 4 becomes 4x cubed when we differentiate and 6x cubed becomes 18x squared. We differentiate again that gives us 12x squared plus 36x. So step 2, 
find out where the first derivative is 0. OK, so we put our 4x cubed plus 18x squared equal to 0. We can factorise that. So we have x squared times 2x plus 9 is 0. And that means we have solutions of x equals 0 or x equals minus 9 over 2. OK, we also may as well find where the second derivative is. The second derivative is 0. That will be useful. So we have 12x squared plus 36x is 0. We can divide by 12 and then factorise, which gives us x times x plus 3 is 0. And that gives us the solutions x is 0 or minus 3. Step 4. Identify turning points and points of inflection. OK, well, we can see that for x equals naught, the first and second derivatives are 0. So in order to identify that as a point of inflection, we also need to check whether d2y by dx squared changes sign. So let's have a look d2y by dx squared when x is equal to minus 0.1 so we're going just to the left of the point then that is minus 87 over 25 we don't really care about the value but the important thing is it's less than 0 whereas if we go just right of the point so just to the right of 0 with x equals 0.1 we get 93 over 25, which is greater than 0. So we can see that it has changed sign, and so that tells us all those facts together tell us we have a stationary point of inflection. Now, we need to know what the y value is here, and so we pop 0 into the original function, and that gives us 0 to the 4 plus 6 times 0 cubed, which is, of course, 0. So we have the point 0, 0. OK, so continuing step four, identify turning points and points of inflection. So the first derivative was zero when x was or is minus nine over two. So what's the value of the second derivative at this point? Well, we put our minus nine over two into the second derivative. That gives us 12 times minus two, nine over two squared plus 36 times minus 9 over 2 and that gives us 81 using our calculator and that is greater than 0. So that tells us we have a minimum. We then put x back into the original function so we have our minus 9 over 2 to the power of 4 plus 6 times minus 9 over 2 cubed that gives us about minus 137 and so we have a minimum at minus 9 over 2, comma, minus 137. But we also notice that the second derivative is 0 when uh, x is minus 3. So if we look either side of minus 3, so if we go to the left of minus 3 or just below minus 3 with x equals minus 3.1 we find that the second derivative is 93 over 25 which is greater than 0 and if we go just the other side to uh, minus 2.9 we get minus 87 over 25 which is less than 0 so it has changed sign. That means the change of sign tells us we have a point of inflection, but we know that the first derivative is non-zero at this point because the only places it was zero was at naught and minus 9 over 2, and so that tells us it's non-stationary. So overall we have a non-stationary point of inflection. We pop our minus 3 back into the original function, which gives us minus 81, and so that's minus 3 comma minus 81 is a non-stationary point of inflection. So we also have to sketch this. So first of all, we'll pop some axes in. Now obviously I haven't drawn these, but you'd work out those numbers because the highest x value for any of the points is 0. And the... Uh, sorry...
So now we have to sketch the curve. So we put some axes in. Obviously I haven't drawn these, but the important thing is how you choose the numbers. So for the x-axis it goes down to minus 9 over 2 and up to 0 in terms of the points. So we go a couple either side of that. In the y-axis our highest value is 0 and our lowest is minus 137. So again we've gone um, a bit either side of those. So then we would put our points on. So we've got naught naught for our stationary point of inflection. We have our minimum there, minus 4.5, minus 137, and our non-stationary point of inflection, minus 3, minus 81. So put those points on. And then we'd want to just put the shape, rough shape, of, of what the curve needs to look like at each point. So we put those there. So at A we've got a minimum. So we sort of do a little minimum bit. At B it's a non-stationary point of inflection. So wobbly sketching, but you can see that it's intending to sort of show that sort of S shape, um, which is going from convex to concave. And then at C we are imagining it coming in from B, and so it's going. Uh, from concave to convex and then we would then join them up I'm doing it with a with the actual curve uh, so you can see what it looks like but you can see that those blue sketchy bits if you did make a curve using them you would get pretty much the curve uh, that it actually is